All right, well, welcome back, everyone. Let's go ahead and begin our next video here on data types and arithmetic computations. So, goals for today's video. As we learn data types and arithmetic computations, it's only natural that we may run into some bugs. So first we'll talk about how do we actually identify bugs and what strategies can we use to fix them. Next, we're going to talk about the different data types in C++ and common mistakes that you'll want to make sure you avoid. Finally, we'll start writing some simple programs that use data types and arithmetic computations. So very common, very important to know how to write these kinds of programs. So real quick, just for fun, let's do a couple quick review questions before we move on. This first question asks us to use one line of code to declare a double type variable named pay rate and set pay rate equal to 30. Then we also have a multiple choice question. Take a moment and think about these. You can pause the video if you want and then we'll discuss. So let's try this first question. Using one line of code, we want to declare a double type variable named pay rate. Remember the syntax we want to use is we say our variable type name and then we give the variable the actual name And that would declare the variable, and then we simply set it equal to whatever value and have a semicolon. So here we want to declare a double type variable, so we write double first. That's the type of variable we're declaring. We want the variable's name to be pay rate. So the next, next item we write is pay rate. And we want to assign pay rate the value 30. So we write it just like that. And we end our statement with a semicolon. In our second question, we're being asked which of the following is true about the most successful programmers? And we want to select all that apply. What did you think? It turns out the correct answer here is choice A and choice B. Choice C and D are actually false. So successful programmers are lazy in a good way. They want to be efficient. They want to make sure the programs they write are programs that are scalable, easy to use, and get the job done. Programmers are also incredibly patient. They're willing to spend hours fighting with problems and understanding what's happening in their programs. If you're looking for an instant gratification career, it may not be programming, actually. Programming requires a great deal of patience. It can definitely pay off when you have the satisfaction of getting your programs to work, but you definitely need to have a good deal of patience, especially while learning programming. So let's keep these points in mind as we continue with today's class. So, so far we've actually covered a number of things about variables, inputs, and outputs. You'll recall from last time we learned that there's a number of different variables we can actually use in C++. We use int type variables to store whole numbers. So when you see int, you should be thinking integer. We can store positive or negative whole numbers in an int variable. 
There's also multiple types of variables that can store decimal numbers. So there's doubles, long doubles, floats. Most often for our class, we choose to use doubles to store decimals. Remember, if you try to store a decimal value in an int variable, you will lose data. So you want to be careful. You only want to put whole numbers in int variables. You want to put decimal numbers in your doubles. And if you're not sure which variable type you want to use, it's probably safest to use a double first, just in case the value being stored happens to be a decimal. We also talked about how char and string can be used to store characters and strings. And a bool type can be used to store a true or a false. We also learned how to use cin and cout in order to input and output data. Remember that cin will read from the keyboard into a variable and it will keep reading until it sees white space, such as a space or a new line. We also learned how to use escape sequences in order to format our inputs and outputs. We saw, for example, we can use the slash n to make a new line, slash t to make a tab, and all sorts of different escape sequences. Most commonly for our purposes, we will use escape sequences in order to format our outputs when using cout. So last class, we also started writing our own C++ programs. And you'll remember that there are several main parts that are common in most of the programs we will write. We will always have those include headers, such as include IO stream. These are the preprocessor directives. They include other files that enable us to use certain commands. For example, cin and cout requires the include IO stream header. Most of the time, for our purposes, we also need to include using namespace standard. This is just the standard naming convention used for C++ variables and C++ names. You'll remember every program must have a main function. And we learned that we put all of our details of our program inside the braces of our main function. Finally, we end our main function with return zero, which tells the compiler that our program ran successfully. And we remember all statements need to end in semicolons and functions must be enclosed in curly braces. As you start getting the hang of writing C++ programs, make sure you remember the purpose of each thing that you are writing. It's a very good practice as a programmer to really understand what each line of code you're doing or really understand what each line of code you write does. So rather than simply memorizing things, try to really understand the importance of each part of your program. Finally, we also talked about good practices. And we started learning some good habits that you want to develop as a programmer. Make sure you remember that all statements in C++ end with semicolons. Also, we generally have only one statement per line and no more than 80 characters per line. We also enclose functions in braces. We indent within braces. And we typically put braces on their own lines. Try to get used to following these conventions. You'll see that in later assignments, it's often part of your grade to follow good programming practices. All right, so let's go ahead and continue on with our new material. And if you have any questions about what we've covered so far, 
feel free to reach out. I also highly recommend that you follow along in your IDE, such as Sea Lion. If you follow along with the code and the examples as we do them in this video, you'll find that it's a lot easier to learn and understand what's happening. So if you haven't already done so, I would highly recommend that you consider opening up your IDE of choice, such as Sea Lion, and following along. So let's go ahead and go through our notes for today, starting with some of our key takeaways. I'd like to begin with a very important point here. Many students watch other people program or know friends who are in programming, and it can be intimidating to learn at first. Many people seem to program so easily, and programming seems to take a long time to learn, especially when you're just starting out. I would like to remind everyone that programming is a lot like running. Programming is a skill that you learn. So to get better at running, you really ultimately need to run. Watching other people run, watching videos about running, and reading about running will only get you so far. If you really want to become an expert runner, you have to run. And the same is true for programming. To get better at writing programs and coding, you have to improve by sitting down and writing programs and coding. So as much as possible, as you're going through these slides and learning C++, be patient and practice as much as you can. As much as you can, write programs yourself. Play around with them. Learn how they work and understand what every line of that program does. Try not to fall in the trap of trying to memorize or watch other people code. The sooner that you can get comfortable with writing your own programs and building them up, the sooner you'll become more confident in your programming skills. So please keep this in mind as we go through the rest of the class today. Take advantage of opportunities to practice programming, just like you would if you were trying to get better at running. Let's move on to our next takeaway. In Sea Lion, our IDE, it turns out there are a lot of very nice tools that will help us debug our programs. So this key takeaway reminds us to use breakpoints and the debugger as much as possible when you are unsure about what is happening. Let's take a look at why this is important and see some examples. So I like to use this term in programming, which I call Cody sense. Cody sense is not an official term. This is just something I made up. Cody sense is a reference to Spider-Man. If you have seen any of the Spider-Man movies or comics, the superhero Spider-Man has what's called Spidey sense, or the ability to sense when danger is nearby. Spidey sense is a lot like good intuition. And so, in this class, I would like to encourage everyone to try to build up what I call your Cody sense, or coding intuition. Because this will help you develop an intuition and a good sense of how to solve problems. So the more you practice coding and writing programs, the better you will get. at solving problems using programming. 
and your Cody sense will improve even more. So let's go ahead and can start out with our very first Cody sense question. You'll see that I frequently like to ask Cody sense questions, and the idea is to ask you something where you may not know the answer right away. But I'd like you to try using your intuition. Take a look at this program and think about what is it supposed to do? And try to develop a little bit of that programmer's intuition. So go ahead and pause the video if you'd like and think about this question. What does this program do? Without knowing anything about this program, what does it do? And is it okay to use int type variables in this program? Well, if we look at this program, the names of the variables give us a big hint. You can see that this program, it will actually take, it takes two exam scores from the user and it calculates the average score. Notice we can also see in the calculation here, we see that the two scores are summed and divided by two to give us an average. So that's why it's also a very good practice to use descriptive variable names. You see that that really helped us understand what this program is doing. Okay, so now let's move on to the second part of the question. Is it okay to use int type variables here? Well, remember, int type variables can only store whole numbers. Is it okay to use a variable that can only store a whole number? Well, it would be okay as long as we are only working with whole numbers. But what happens if we have a decimal? Could we run into any problems if we try to put a decimal number in a whole number? Yeah, so some of you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, maybe we should be using a double or another decimal variable instead. It might not be okay. If we need to use decimals, or if we have decimal variables. If we try to store a decimal in an int, we might run into some problems. But let's pretend that our Cody sense wasn't working so well and we weren't so sure. Suppose we went ahead and ran this program and you'll see that some strange things might start happening. Suppose I entered 99.5 as my exam one score, and we'll see if we do that, the program will immediately end and it won't let you enter 70 for a second exam score. You might be wondering, well, that's strange. What's going on? Let's go ahead and demonstrate this program so everyone can see 
what's going on. And then we'll cover how we fix it. All right, so here you can see our exam score program. So notice we have our exam scores and our average, and we're using int type variables right now. And so we can go ahead and run this program. So I'll go ahead and run our Cody Sense exam scores. And so here, I'm given the opportunity to enter my scores. So, you know, say if I got 100 on my first exam and 80 on my second exam, well, that's working okay, right? My average score is between 180 is 90. No problem there. But if I run it again, like before, where I got in 99.5 the first time around, Oh, that's not good. Why does this not like 99.5? Could it be because I chose to use int variables here? Let's take a closer look. And I would like to demonstrate something for you that is an incredibly important debugging skill. It's called adding a breakpoint. So within CLion, it's actually possible to use what's called a breakpoint to help debug your programs. A breakpoint will allow your program to pause And so it will pause at the specified line. And then you can check the values of variables and other data to help determine what is wrong. So let's pretend we had no idea what was going wrong with our program earlier. Let's go ahead and add a breakpoint, and I will demonstrate how you can use this to debug. Basically, all we need to do is put a breakpoint, and then we can click this little bug icon to run the debugger. When we run the debugger, the program will pause at the breakpoint and a debugging menu will appear. Once we have the debugger, then we can see we can see the values of each variable at that point in the program. So let's go ahead and try this. Okay, so I'm back in Sea Lion, and so I've decided to put a breakpoint to figure out what is wrong. I'm going to go ahead and put a breakpoint on line 11 here, because I know strange things started to happen when I gave my exam one score. So I'll put my breakpoint at line 11 so I can figure out what's happening. So I just left click in that area, this area here next to the line numbers, and that makes a little red dot. That is our breakpoint. Then I move up to the top menu and I press debug. Notice it's not the run arrow, but the debug button. Notice that now the program has started running, but it has stopped at line 11 and paused. Now I can see what's going on in this program. Also, my debugging menu has appeared. Notice right now I can see 
that my exam one score is currently initialized to zero, and it's an int type. Exam two score is also currently uninitialized, and average score also is uninitialized at zero. So if I click on that debugger tab in the left here, I'm able to see this view. If I want, I can also type in other names of expressions if there are other variables I wanted to watch. If I click on this console tab, I can also see what would have been outputted to the screen. I can also view memory and the values of the variables by clicking on these other tabs. Other important buttons here are these commands in the top. I would like to especially draw your attention to step over this F8 button. Notice if I click step over, it will allow me to run the program one line at a time. Meanwhile, I can follow along what's happening by looking in the console, or I can track the values of the variables in the variable view. So usually I'm tracking my variables and also checking the console as I click step over. So here if I click step over, notice I was just prompted to enter my exam one score. So here, let's go ahead and enter 99.5. We know that something strange is going to happen once we hit enter. So let's see what happens. So right now the program has paused and we are now on line 13. We are just about to output the next cout statement. Before I click step over again, I'm going to go back to the debugger. And notice I can look and see my variables. Do you see what happened here? Remember we told exam one score that it was supposed to have the value 99.5. But wait a minute. We only stored 99 in exam one score. We did not store 99.5. Remember what we said about int variables? Int variables can only hold whole numbers. So the 0.5 actually cannot be stored in exam one score. I can only store 99. Notice the 0.5 was completely truncated off and lost. We didn't do any rounding. The 99.5 became 99, and we lost the decimal. Just for fun, let's step over again and see what happens next. So notice I'm still, nothing's happened yet. I need to step again. Now I'm being asked to enter my exam two score. But look. My exam 2 score was read as 0 because 99 was read into the first value, and then the 0.5 from the 99 was read as 0 for my exam 2 score. So now, because I have a 99 and a 0, 99 plus 0 divided by 2, that is going to give me an average of 49.5, but wait a minute. Because average score is also an int type, it will not accept 90, it will not take 49.5, we'll lose our decimal again. We are left with an average score of just 49. And notice we can continue pushing step over, and now our program has finished. Notice how powerful this debugger is. We were able to see exactly what was happening in our program at that point. And we could run our program one line at a time until we figured out what was going wrong. 
by running the debugger, we realized that using int type variables is not a good idea here. We do not want to store things that could be decimals in an int type. What type of variable should we use instead of int for these variables? Let's try a double type. Because remember, double type variables can store decimals. And so if I change my variables from int types to double types, now they should be able to store decimals. Let's go ahead and try running the program again. I'll leave the breakpoint on line 11 so we can track what happens if we instead use double type variables. So notice initially our double variables are uninitialized. We have not yet given them any value. Let's use step over to walk through our program. So we can give it our exam one score is 99.5. Let's see what is stored in our double variable. If I move back to the debugger view, hey, look at that. Because I used a double type variable, I can store decimal numbers. So storing a 99.5 is not a problem at all. I did not lose any data when storing that 99.5. Had I tried to put 99.5 in an int, you'll remember that I had lost that 0.5 when I tried to store 99.5 in an int. Now that I have a double, I can store those decimal places no problem. Let's continue running our program line by line. Now we need to enter our exam 2 score. So let's say we got a 70. Now we can continue running, so we'll step over. We're about to calculate our average exam score. And notice, if we go ahead and check our variables, we see that our average score was calculated as 84.75, and the result is correctly outputted to the screen if we step to the end of the program. So now we figured out what was wrong with this program. Variable types do matter. And in this program, it's possible that our inputs may be whole numbers or decimals. We need to be able to run correctly regardless of what the input is. So we need to use double type variables here. So next time you run into any sort of bug in your C++ programs, try following a similar approach as this. Try using the debugger in order to track what's going on in your program. This is an extremely powerful and useful tool. So once again, just to recap, once we ran the debugger, you saw that we could click Step Over. By clicking step over, we can run our code line by line and track what was happening in our program. Let's just briefly summarize what we learned from this demo. First, variable types matter. Be careful. Don't try to squeeze a decimal number like 99.5 into an int variable. Remember, int variables can only store whole numbers. So notice if I try to store 99.5 in an int, I will lose the decimal places. 99.5 will become 99. Notice rounding will not happen because the decimal place 
is simply chopped off. It's called a truncation error. Next key takeaway. Be careful what you assume about your input data. It might be easy to accidentally assume that our input will always be a whole number. But your user may not always give you what you expect. And if you calculate the average or do some math, your answer may not always be a whole number. So it's always good to be careful about what you assume for your data. If you are ever unsure about whether your data will always be a whole number, probably a good idea to use double type variables just to be safe. That way you can accommodate both whole numbers and decimal numbers. Last point, sea lion is your friend. IDEs like sea lion have incredibly powerful debugging tools. Make sure you learn how to use these tools. Try going back through this demo that we just did on your own and verify that you can do the same thing. Learning how to use these tools will make your life so much easier when you're trying to understand more complex programs. And of course, remember you're always welcome to reach out for help if you run the debugger and you're still having trouble understanding what's going on. All right, so that brings us to our next takeaway for today. Let's talk about bugs. A bug is a mistake in a program. And there's three main types that we tend to encounter. First type of bug is a syntax error. This is just a violation of the grammar rules. Maybe you just forgot a semicolon. or something really small like that. You just didn't follow the grammar rules and that caused the program to not compile. Syntax errors are usually pretty easy to fix. Next type of error is a runtime error. These are errors that cause the program to crash while it is running. So the program was able to compile, but for whatever reason, it crashed while running. These can happen for a variety of reasons. For example, maybe your program is reading a data file. It expected a letter, but you gave it a number instead. Things like that can trigger runtime errors. Next type of bug is logic errors. These tend to be the most difficult to diagnose because they are errors in the program's algorithm. These could be very special edge cases that you may not have planned for when you originally designed your program. That's why it's very important, especially when you're writing a complex program, to take some time to write an algorithm and make sure you capture Make sure you capture all possible cases that are relevant. For example, making sure that you recognize that maybe for that exam score calculation program, exam scores could be both whole numbers or decimals. And you want to be able to run with both. So just a bit of fun programming history. It turns out that bugs or mistakes in a program are actually called bugs because the first ever bug was an actual moth found in a computer. And so the term stuck. And so from then on, errors in a computer program were also referred to as bugs. Right, so now that we've talked a bit more about bugs 
data types. Let's, let's just go through our next takeaway. This one is really important. In general, you should store values in variables of the same type. Otherwise, errors can happen. So, like we saw a moment ago, we should store whole numbers in int type variables, decimal numbers in double types, etc. Notice we should be especially careful to avoid losing decimal places when using int variables. For example, we saw how if we tried to store 99.5 in an int, we would end up with 99 and lose the decimal place. So be careful there. Remember to use the right data type for whatever you're trying to store. Let's try a quick Cody Sense question. Suppose I have this code on the right. What will be the output of this code? Take a moment and think about it, and then we'll discuss. So what do you think? First number is equal to one, and second number is equal to three. So if I have C out, one divided by three, what's that gonna give us? Is that gonna be choice A, 0 0.333? How about B or C? Believe it or not, the correct answer here is actually choice C. Because in this case, one and three are treated as int variables. And so if I output the result of one divided by three, the result is also treat it as an int. And so if I try to store 0 0.333 in an int variable, we lose the decimal places. And then the result is actually outputted as zero. So believe it or not, you got to be really careful here because both of these inputs are ints. Our result is also going to be an int and we lose a decimal place. That brings us to a very important key takeaway. For this class, generally whole numbers should be stored as int type variables. So if you are 100% sure the variable will always be a whole number, if you're 100% sure the variable will always be a whole number, then use an int type. But if you are not exactly 100% sure if the decimal or if the variable could contain decimal values, we generally use a double type. So notice for the purposes of this class, we primarily use int and double type variables for storing numbers.
whole numbers and ints, doubles for decimals. One other thing to be mindful of here is some small details about int and double types. Int type variables are stored as exact values. So number one stored as, a, stored as an int is exactly that int. However, double type numbers, such as, you know, say you were storing 1.23456, once you reach the maximum precision, there's going to be some other random digits that appear after. And these occur due to memory limitations. So please be aware that double type variables can actually be stored as approximate values due to limited significant digits. So you want to be mindful that sometimes these approximations, you know, usually it's very, very small numbers, but it can impact your program if you're not careful. Okay, so once again, let's just summarize our key takeaways here. So first, use int type variables only when you're 100% sure that that value will always be a whole number. Otherwise, store numbers in double types. Next point, more precision requires data types with more memory because you need to be able to store more digits. Next, very small and very large numbers require more memory due to having many digits. It's just like if you are typing a book, if you have more words, you need more pages to store those words, simply because more digits requires more memory. If you have very small number or very large number, you have a lot of digits there, so you require more memory. And finally, once again, as we've discussed in our demos and slides, make sure you do not store variables in the wrong data type. Generally, you do not want to do this because as we saw, it might create some unexpected bugs. One last point about variable types. So I just have this in here for you as an FYI. This is not something that I would ask about on exams. C++ has this auto variable type. Auto actually tells the compiler to figure out what data type you want using the initialized value. So for example, if I used auto test score is 12, auto would automatically make test score a double type. Or if I have auto letter grade is D, then letter grade would be made a char type. because char is used to store individual characters. So generally, we will not use autotypes in this class. The issue with autotypes is it could potentially introduce bugs or errors in your program, because how do you know letter grade is always just going to be one letter? Or what happens if your test score needs to have a lot more digits and be a different data type? So generally, 
I discourage use of auto data types in this class simply because they may accidentally create bugs that you're not expecting. But if you take more advanced programming classes, or if you see other people using auto, now you know what auto does. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to our next takeaways here. Remember, you're welcome to reach out if you have any other questions. So our next key takeaway, make sure that you do math correctly in C++. Many operators in C++ work just like in math class. So, you know, plus, minus, multiply, divide, you know, these are all the same as math class. Notice that multiplication does require the asterisk operator, so you can't just say a, b, you have to say a times b. And then there's also this new operator called the modulus that returns the remainder. For example, 5 modulus 2 will return 1 because 5 divided by 2 is 2 remainder 1. Order of operations is also very similar to math class, except we have multiplication division, then modulus, then addition and subtraction. So modulus comes after multiplication division, but before addition and subtraction. All right, once again, just a little bit more about the modulus operand. Once again, the modulus operator gives the remainder from dividing integers. So both inputs must be integers. Here we see 5 modulo 3 is 2 because 5 divided by 3 is 1 with a remainder of 2. Also remember, modulus in order of operations, it's between multiplication division and addition subtraction. So as we noted earlier, multiplication does require the asterisk operator. So please be careful if you are writing mathematical formulas from engineering or math class. Remember, you can't just put variables next to each other to multiply. You have to have the asterisk operator to multiply two variables. Also, in order to do exponents, notice you need to use the power function exponent operator does not work. Power function also requires include CMath. Finally, remember you still can use parentheses in order to maintain the order of operations. So just like in math class, you may need parentheses from time to time. Okay, next takeaway. This one is also a very important point to make, and it's also a very common mistake made by beginning students. So be careful here. Make sure you remember that the equal operator, the single equal sign, this operator assigns value. It does not do algebra. So for example, if I say x equals 2, 
the equal sign assigns the value 2 to x. So that assignment operator can be used to assign a value to one variable or many. So notice here we can set everybody equal to 5. And then this next one is also kind of interesting. If I write sum equals sum plus 1, this will add 1 to sum. For example, if sum was 2, sum equals sum plus 1 would give sum is 2 plus 1, so sum would be assigned the value 3 if I wrote sum equals sum plus 1. So notice I'm not doing algebra there, I'm purely assigning value. Let's do another practice question. So here I have some code. I'm declaring an int variable named my number. I'm setting my number equal to my number plus one, and then outputting my number to the screen. But what value is actually being outputted here? Take a moment and think about it, then we'll discuss. So if you're thinking something's off, you're on the right track. Did we ever give my number an initial value? No, we didn't. What is the initial value? The initial value depends on what compiler you're using. So some compilers give uninitialized values the value 0, others just have random values, basically whatever was left in the memory, and then still others just won't compile. So in this case, a, C, and D could, could all be true. It depends on your compiler. Some compilers might initialize your initial value, my number, to zero. Oh, that would actually give the output here would be my number plus one or one had we initialized my number to zero. But in other compilers, you'll either not compile at all or print random garbage as your answer. So, got to be very careful here. Let's make sure we give our variables an initial value. So that brings us to our next point, variables and initialization. A variable which has not been assigned a value is called uninitialized. It just doesn't hold a value yet. It's just sitting there waiting for a value. Typically, uninitial vari variables will have some random value. 
based on whatever happened to be in that memory currently. So depending on what compiler you're using, some compilers will return an error, some will not. Best practice is to always assign a value to a variable before you use it. That way you avoid errors related to initialization. So make sure you ensure your variables are initialized before doing math or before using them. Let's move on to our next takeaway. If we're doing math with different data types, we need to be careful of what's called coercion rules. For example, if I want to add 1.55 plus 2, this could be a double, 2 could be an int. Coercion rules tell us what result we should expect if we do math with variables of different types. So let's take a look at what these rules are. Here's the general rules that you will want to remember. Make sure you remember these. They do come up from time to time as we write programs in this class. So the rule is, if we do math with variables of the same data type, the result will be the same data type. That's why we saw that 1 divided by 3, if these are both ints, 1 divided by 3 is technically 0 0.333, right? But if we divide 2 ints, we saw that the result will actually be 0. If we add, subtract, multiply, or divide with two variables of different data types, notice what will happen is the result will be the data type with the largest number of digits. So if we add an int and a double, we will have the result be a double. So basically we get promoted to the data type with higher precision. And then lastly, once again, a reminder about doing math with two int variables. If you do math with two int variables, the result will be an int, and you will lose any decimals that are present in that calculation. For example, that 1 divided by 3 was equal to 0 because we lost the 0.333, and we ended up only with the 0 part. You can use modulus to help recover the remainder, but still you want to be careful not to lose data in your calculations. Another important rule. This rule is a little more subtle, but be careful. If we use the assignment operator, notice that the expression on the right is converted to the type on the left. So in this example, we see that my number is int type, and so the value 4.5 gets converted to an int and becomes 4. 
So if I try to output my number, but I put 4.5 in there, I'm going to output 4 because I lose the decimal places. 4.5 was converted to an int. So be careful there. That's a very subtle error, but it does happen from time to time. All right, one more rule to be careful of. Be careful about how whole numbers are treated when doing math. Whole numbers 1 and 2 are treated as ints. So 1 divided by 2 is 0 0.5, but because I was dividing ints, that causes the result to be an int. And here we lose our decimals. So be very careful. One way to avoid this problem, you could simply write 1.0 divided by 5. That makes the numerator a double type. Let's try another quick example. Suppose I have first number and second number shown here. Questions asking, what will that C out statement output? Take a moment and think about this, and then we'll discuss. Well, if we look at this output, we see that we have a double plus an int. What data type will my result be? It will be the one with the higher precision, which in this case is a double. So that means 4 plus, or in this case, 1.23456 plus 4 is going to be 5.23456, and the decimals are preserved. So therefore, choice A is the correct answer. Okay, so we talked about these coercion rules, but sometimes there are situations where we need to force outputs to be a certain type. Sometimes we need to override coercion rules or avoid truncation errors when dividing ints. So this tool static cast can help us. Let's briefly demonstrate how static cast works. Here's a quick demo. Suppose I have double my number equals 1 divided by 2. What will that output? Well, you might remember that both 1 and 2 are treated as ints, so this will actually output 0 because 1 divided by 2 is 0 0.5, but if we put it as an int, it will become 0. We lose the decimals.
But notice what we can do with this thing called static cast. Static cast will read its value as the specified type. So here, one is read as a double. If we treat one as a double, then when we divide one by two, this will become 0 0.5 because one was a double. The result was made also a double. Okay, last, last example though, this one's a little tricky. Notice one divided by two is inside the parentheses. So that happens first. So one divided by two is gonna be zero. Static cast of zero. that result will be zero. So notice the position of the parentheses also matters. You wanna make sure you convert ints to doubles before you start doing that math. Let's briefly demonstrate this example. So here we have our static cast example. Let's go ahead and run it. And notice the output we get is exactly like we had described. Also notice that Sea Lion is a little bit nervous. See this warning message that happens when I hover my mouse over the one in one half? Sea Lion has detected that we're trying to divide integers and it's warning us about a loss of data. And notice we do see that double my number equals one half, that one half will be truncated into a zero. Similarly, if I use static cast correctly, notice this one is read as a double, double divided by int is double, and the second line, my number is static cast double one half, that one will give us the correct output due to reading one as a double. Finally, notice our last example also has that warning message. That's because Sea Lion has detected that this one half is going to be converted into an int and give us the value zero. So definitely make sure you recognize when to use static cast correctly. It's actually very easy to use. You just put the type you want to read as in the triangle brackets. That will ensure that the item in parentheses is read as that type. So just to summarize how this works, is we just put the de desired type and then the thing to read in, paren in parentheses. So in this case here, the one is read as a double. Here, one divided by two equals zero is read as a double. But here we read as a double too late. We had already had the truncation error happen.
So make sure you remember Static Cast. There will be times in the future when we'll need to use this to help us. All right, we have just a couple more points for today. It's possible to format and adjust how outputs are formatted when using C out. So if you use the include IOMANIP header, additional functions and commands become available to you. I don't expect you to memorize these extra formatting commands, but make sure that you know there are ways to format your output from C out. So let's briefly do an example of how these things work. We'll see fixed will basically force decimal notation. Set precision causes us to use that many decimal places. Show point forces the decimal point to be printed. And set width controls the output field to be the specified number of characters. Here's a quick example of what that might look like. Notice the set width 15 in these outputs here has created a 15 character output field. And notice there's three digits of precision because set precision three was used for all the outputs. We don't usually do this type of format formatting much in this class, but it may come up in the future, so it's good to know about. All right, the last item for today is about operator shorthand. Programmers like to be efficient, and this is often used by more experienced programmers. If you're trying to fit a line of code into only 40 characters or 80 characters per line, then sometimes it's convenient to use operator shorthand to make math more compact. Here's a few examples. I don't expect you to start doing this right away, but as you get more experience, you can try using some of the shorthand. But either the shorthand or the non-shorthand are both correct. So either one can be used, but more experienced programmers often use shorthand. So a couple examples, num plus plus, that is shorthand for num equals num plus one. Counter plus equals two is the same as counter equals counter plus two. Notice that shorthand also works with variables. So cost minus equals savings. That's the same as writing cost equals cost minus savings. We can also do multiplication and division and even modulus using shorthand. So as you get more comfortable with math and programming, you may find that you prefer to use the shorthand as well. All right, so that is it for our video for today. So hopefully now everybody's a bit more comfortable with bugs and debugging strategies. 
and also just using data types in C++. Make sure you recognize when to use each data type, and be careful to avoid common mistakes, such as losing data if you store a decimal value in an int variable. Also remember to use tools like StaticCast to help avoid potential errors when working with data. Finally, hopefully now you're starting to get a little more comfortable with writing simple programs that do calculations. I'd highly encourage you to go back through the examples we did on your own. Try playing with them and make sure you understand them. We'll continue to build on all of these skills over the next few weeks. Well, thank you everyone for joining the fun and we will see you in the next video.